And thank you for the water. Appreciate that. Um, all right, now we're gonna. Now I need a volunteer to come up so I can cast out your demons. All right, so. Um, all right. I was serious. I need. Okay. All right. So. Here we go. Now move forward, uh, page ten. And here we're going to quickly take a look at non-Christian views about God or deficient views of God. And as I said earlier, there's a, there's a, there's a lot to say about who God is. Um, look at people in the world. People in the world are divided up into monotheist, polytheist, pantheist, dualist, uh, and these five or six basic theistic views account for everybody in the world. Um, this is why you don't have to learn, you know, the 2,500 different names of the gods and things like that. You want to learn the basics, you know, here's what you do, because anybody you come across in the world is going to fit one of these conceptual schemes, with the last couple being skepticism and atheism uh, as views. Now, in this case, though, as we're dividing up the uh, uh, the ideas, we'll start with pantheism and start to move forward because we're, we're going to deal with defective monotheistic views when we look at Trinitarianism. So, let's start with pantheism on page 10. And just realize that probably about a third of the world is really in some sense pantheistic. You know, those who hold to it's kind of Eastern thought so this is not an insignificant study. And so when we look at this, there are a couple of things. What, what does pantheism mean? Again, pan, all, and theos, God. And then what's always connected with pantheism is monism. Everything is one thing or substance. So, in a pantheistic worldview, everything's divine. Everything's one substance. Because uh, if there were more than one substance that's divine, what would that be? Polytheism. There's more than one God. So, pantheism, by definition, is monistic. Okay? And you'll see that word monism cropping up in your apologetics and theology in a number of places. For example, sadly, some of those who are either call themselves post-conservative or uh, neo or uh, other types of evangelicals that aren't the real evangelicals um, have adopted this sort of uh, uh, holistic physicalism for humanity where we just don't have souls. They reject substance dualism. Hence, we're nothing more than our bodies. Okay. And that's, that's also described as a monistic position. So. And so you'll see that, that, that term cropping up throughout your studies. But in this case, monism means, uh, with respect to pantheism, uh, it's just that. It's everything is one thing. So here's the point. When we think about these worldview structures, these defective theistic structures, what we've got to do is uh, you know, sort of flesh this stuff out when you're talking with someone and not only does it help you in evangelism, but it's also going to clarify the biblical view. This is what it's not, okay? And the more you know what it's not, it's a lot easier to say what it is. So, so when we look at pantheism, remember I said yesterday, it's absolute eminence, okay? Which means to be present, active in the creation. So while God, our, the biblical God is imminent, which by the way, if you put an I here, that means something that's about to happen. Okay, imminent is not immanent. Okay, so, so imminence is God present and active in the creation, which is true of the biblical God. But for pantheism, God is the creation. Okay, so it's absolute imminence. Well, there is no transcendence in the pantheistic view. So the, East, the person who holds to some kind of Eastern religion 
Hinduism, whatever it happens to be, says what? Well, they're recognizing, in some sense, God's written on their heart, but they're skewed in their interpretation, that go, there's something divine working in the creation, and then they skew it to say, well, everything's divine. Okay. So, so there is a kernel of truth to this, but then it's falsely, grossly misinterpreted. Uh, that yes, God is imminent, but he's not absolutely imminent. So, and so we have to concern ourselves with that. Now the key to begin to discuss this is, like I said, when people in other worldviews affirm these things, the problem is they want to affirm the ideology, but then no one, no one can live consistently 100% with a pantheistic worldview. No one. Uh, because, and that's what you constantly want to bring out, is that, you know, literally, you say this, but you do this. You're not, you know, you're not following what you say you believe. In other words, you don't really believe it. Okay. Guess what? I don't believe it either, so why don't you become a Christian? You know, you know it's like talking to Mormons, you know. You find out they really don't believe Joseph Smith's first vision. I, I, I eyeball them and say, you know, you tell me that my church is wrong, that uh, my, what I believe is an abomination, and I personally am corrupt. You tell me that, man. I give them the googly eyes. Come on, man. <laughs> you know, and, you know. And they're like, well, um, yeah, you know, like this. Like, Look, you don't believe that, do you? You really don't believe the first vision. Guess what? I don't either. So become a Christian and leave the Mormon church. So, you know, I mean, come on. You know you don't believe that stuff. So, yeah. From the Christian perspective, can't we try to turn that around and also strengthen our own group as far as a lot of people walk away from Christianity or they reject it for that same argument? Like, there's certain things in our faith that we say that we believe, but then when we don't hold to it, they go, well, you don't believe ah. that either. But see, no. Well, see, no, because our, our faith says there are some people who say they believe and, and they're tares in the wheat field. So you have to have a comprehensive understanding of it. Uh, also, our faith says that uh, salvation doesn't equal sinless perfection. So the fact is, is, no one promised you you wouldn't struggle with sin for the rest of your life. We actually live, can live completely consistently with the system. Anybody here struggling with any sin? They don't have to raise your hand, but uh, yeah. <laughs> So the people who walk away from it, they may have been given some, you know, primrose promise about what Christianity was, but real Christianity, you actually can live 100% consistently with. Uh, walking with God, acknowledging there's real sin in our life, that there's struggle with sin. And the question is, what kind of Christianity are, are, are we talking about? The real stuff or something that's slightly off, way off? So, so that's why, you know, because we acknowledge there really is a God He's, you know, we can, we can take care of the problem of evil. The problem is God's not taking care of it right now because if he did, we, we'd all be punished right now. The fact that God's merciful that he suspends the sentence uh, until later on. You know, pantheism, in fact, we go there. Again, there's five different kinds of pantheism, but pantheism can never take care of the problem of evil because if God is all, God is good, and God is spirit, what do they do with evil? Evil is... Maya, it's illusion, doesn't exist. Really? See, we, we say evil exists. We can live perfectly consistently with that. Uh, the pantheist says evil, evil doesn't exist and that they all carry around a set of keys. They have courts. Uh, they have, you know, you name it. They act as if, constantly act as if evil really exists. They, they, don't, pretend, they don't really believe it doesn't exist. See, that's a key example. We acknowledge evil. In fact, we acknowledge that <laughs> even though our hearts are renewed and uh, we're children of God, we still sin. We still commit some of the evil uh, and some of the sin. And at the same time, God has made a provision for us. So that actually, I guess that explains the world. So one more, and then I want to, again, hold questions to the end so we can keep, uh, keep going here. Actually, the, the whole problem is karma, justice, all that is nonsense because, again, did God sin and God has to do justice now? See, the point is, it's just, it doesn't, 
pantheism is one, it's, well, like I said, atheism is the worst, because even demons are better than atheists, remember? So, because uh, even demons believe in God, uh, and they're monotheists, but, uh, uh, but you get to pantheism, it just literally leads to contradiction after contradiction. Only God exists. Um, what does that make you? God. You, but you forgot you were God. So God forgot that he was God. So salvation is remembering that you were God, self-realization. Okay? So, but if I'm God, how did I forget I was God? Okay. Well, you know, thank you, sir. Oh. Is this the potion? Okay, so, thank you, sir. So, that, that, uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, Professor Van Helsing, a.k.a. Scott Smith, has uh, you know, made me my potion here for the rest of the class, so we'll, uh, uh, we'll go ahead and deal with that. <laughs> so anyway, um, but even that to say, well, what's, what's evil? It's an illusion, but only God exists. Where'd the illusion come from? Now you have two things, God and illusion. Shut up. Okay, good. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so you, so you get the basic problem here. Look, I mean, of all, I mean, this and atheism, that's why I, I sort of chart that out on uh, you're comparing monotheism, pantheism, and atheism. Atheism and pantheism are the worst sort of of the worldviews and have the least amount of explanatory power of, of pretty much anything uh, as far as consistency goes. And, but let's just quickly kind of take a look at these. Um, page 10, the different kinds of, of pantheism. Um, real pantheism is absolute pantheism, and everything else on here is really an accommodation to reality, but still trying to hold on to pantheism. Okay? And that's really what it is. So, again, um, the second one there, materialistic pantheism or physicalist. Now, these are people who, in effect, the universe to them is divine, but it's, but it's physical only. These are the atheists who, you know, the fact is they still have the God-shaped vacuum, so to speak. They know they're, they're in the image of God, so they've got to worship something. So they deify the physical world. Okay? And you, you know this happens. I, I'm, I like animal planet stuff, and I like looking at, you know, nature programs, and you can tell they, all these all these you know atheistic evolutionary shows. They have these nature shows, and there's still these sweeping things of the canyons and everything else. And they have this almost you know magical and uh, spiritual music playing in the background because got to remember for them this is the highest of anything you can get is the creation itself. Hence they worshipped and served the creation rather than the creator. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, pray to the, well, virtually, yeah. I mean, uh, so you pray to the universe, man. But they don't understand that there is a magical unicorn behind it all. So, uh, so that's a problem with these guys. So as we, uh, you know, as you move forward, but the point is, is that, look, functionally, they're, while they're not going to call the universe God, functionally, they're really sort of materialistic or, or physicalist pantheist. Uh, and, more, and so they act as if they think the universe itself or the physical stuff is divine. There. I'll let that cool off. Last thing I need now is it for scald my throat. So <laughs> then strange noises would come out of me. I don't want that to happen. So, all right. Modal pantheism. <laughs> now, in this case, um, finite things. How do you explain... If God is infinite, and God is all, and God is impersonal, and God is spirit, and all that, how do you explain limited, finite things? Okay. And some brighter philosophical pantheists came up with modal pantheism, okay. that finite things are modes of God. Okay. Go ahead, refute them. Uh-uh. Okay, that doesn't work. Okay, now try a better one. Uh, how, how do you refute that? Well, part of it is, and again, I'll save you the trouble here for the sake of time, and that is you've got to know really what a mode is of something. And we're going to cover that, those distinctions pretty quickly here, but 
we think about a mode, um, a mode is a way or manner in which an entire substance exists. Okay? And we're going to cover the distinction. It's called a formal distinction, uh, modal distinction, real essential distinction. You know, all the stuff you memorize in the spring, right? You know, going through the syllabi. Uh, but, but what distinguishes a formal distinction from a modal distinction is a formal distinction really distinguishes a single aspect or part within a thing, like a property characteristic. Like if you have a red ball, you can distinguish redness from sphericity and you're identifying a particular property. Whereas a modal distinction, you're distinguishing the way the entire thing exists at the same time. And the classic example of that would be you know, uh, liquid water or ice. They're both really, the substance is H2O. There isn't really a new property, but you're really at that point distinguishing the mode of existing. It's not a different substance, it's the same substance, but in a different mode. Okay. Now the problem with the water illustration is that a physical thing can't be in three modes at the same time. It has to be in different modes successively, or you have to have different quantities of the stuff existing in different modes at the same time. That's why it can't ever be a true Trinitarian example. But it is, is a great example of a modal distinction. So, so this is why, you know, now you apply that concept of mode or modal distinction to pantheism. They say, well, finite things are modes of God. And they say, no, 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 time out. Hey, you're misusing the concept of mode because some of these people in debates with Christians would say something like, well, so you guys say that the persons of the Trinity are three modes of God and they can be distinct and yet one. So why not finite things are the modes of God? And that's where you do the big time out and say, yeah, except that for you to be a mode of the essence, that particular mode of existing has to have every property of the essence in it for it to be a mode of the essence. So since God is infinite, spiritual, all these things, that thing that is limited, physical, whatever, isn't a mode of the essence because it doesn't have the properties of infinitude or spirituality and things like that. So it can't, you're just misusing the term mode. And it's completely unlike the way the Trinity is. So, but part of that is you just have to learn, you know, part of that is learning the proper distinctions to unpack this stuff. So, but just know there's some, you know, you get into the better debates with some of these folks uh, and you'll, uh, you, you'll come up with that. Idealism, we're technically in sort of classic absolute pantheism, God is impersonal. So, but you just have to deal with the fact that there's teleology in the universe, there's relation, there's things like that. So people came up with absolute idealism. See, all is really mind now, okay? So God is in some sense personal on sort of the fringes, but at the core he's still impersonal. So the idea that all is mind, uh, examples of this, you know, Mary Baker Eddy's Christian Science, things like God is triply divine, Gnostic principle, life, truth, and love, uh, and, you know, things like that. But, uh, of course, with Christian Science, you know, again, for the, anybody know about Christian Science? Know, know anybody who's a Christian scientist? Yeah. Their big thing, while they're not really that popular anymore, they were really big back in the early, you know, 1900s, all the way pretty much to the 50s and 60s, and then they just sort of tanked uh, in the last 40, 50 years. They have these really nice old buildings and nice churches everywhere and Christian science reading rooms, but there, there, ain't, there just isn't a whole lot out there. <laughs> now, their claim to fame is supposedly healing, uh, you know, Christian science healing, and see, but, but see, what's their theory behind it? Well, just like evil is an illusion, sickness is an illusion. See, so, the only, so bottom line is the only reason you're sick is because the dream state that you're in, the divine dream, you're dreaming wrongly. You're thinking wrongly. See, the fact that you think the material world exists, that's just a dream state you're in. You're not recognizing reality. So... Christian science practitioner is going to teach you to dream correctly because ideas are reality. If you change your ideas, you change reality. Okay. So 
this is, and of course, uh, the reality behind that is it doesn't work. Okay, good. So, um, now that said, um, of course, my cup's leaking all over the place now, but uh, yeah, it doesn't work. That's why, you know, one of the most dangerous places in the world is to go to a Christian science church on Sunday morning. They're all sitting there sneezing over each other going, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, okay? Uh, so, but it is uh, instructive for us about the group that they actually have these little timeouts that you can do. Uh, you know, you see, you can only pretend about reality for so long uh, but see, when you have your femur sticking out the side of your leg, uh, you know, that's when you do a, a reality timeout. And see, then you're, it's okay to go to a doctor and have them set the bone and sew everything up. And then you can go back to saying, my leg doesn't hurt, my leg doesn't hurt, uh, you know, and, and do that. So, uh, but, but literally, that's the kind of stuff. And Mary Baker Eddy, part of her, you know, the, the hypocrisy was she's, it's like Benny Hinn asking his followers about a month ago for two and a half million dollars because the ministry was short on funds. You know, if, if you didn't hear that, it's like, see, every single person should have said, he's what? Two and a half million dollars short? I thought he was the guru of name it and claim it, you know? How come he didn't get his 30, 60, 100 fold uh, return from his seed faith? So, see, everybody should have walked away at that point instead of ponying up another, you know, two and a half million dollars that he supposedly needed. Uh, just like Mary Baker Eddy, she wore glasses, had false teeth, and had all sorts of things. So uh, it didn't really work for her either. Uh, so, in fact, that um, there's a, I'm sure it's another apocryphal story, but uh, uh, they, uh, you know, guy who was a you know, Baptist and a Lutheran both died. They attended a Baptist and Lutheran church. They didn't really believe the stuff. And they're sitting there in hell going, you know, Baptist said, if I'd done what my pastor said, I wouldn't be here. Lutheran said, you know, if I'd done what my pastor said, I wouldn't be here. And the Christian scientist was in the corner saying, I'm not here, I'm not here, I'm not here. So, uh, so just didn't work very well. So, all right, so look at, uh, so the last one there, emanational pantheism is, well, again, how do, you, how do you account for physicality, finite things, personality, things like that, when you're trying to say, God is all, God is spirit, God is impersonal, God is all these things. Well, emanational pantheism. See, God is unfolding like a lotus flower, where at the core, he's all this spirit and impersonal and things like that, but on the edges, he's personal and finite and uh, things like that. So in other words, that's just starting to look a whole lot more like monotheism and transcendence and everything else. Why? Because that's the way the world is, okay? Uh, because the world is both, you know, indicates transcendence, immanence, design, uh, different types of substances, personhood, uh, and all of that. So, but see, you want to hold on to your pantheism and at the same time affirm reality, but you can't do it. You can't connect the two. So, but again, all of those are accommodations uh, to, uh, uh, to pantheism. So, the re what we're going to evaluate is real pantheism, absolute pantheism, because these others aren't, aren't true pantheism. So, problem with pantheists, you know, you must say, bottom of page 10, God exists, but I do not. Okay. Well, why? Because there, there's only one thing. But yet, again, you go to every Hindu temple, and what do they do? They're worshiping a statue. You've got subject and object, but only one thing exists. Okay. So it's incoherent. In fact, see, if only one thing exists, that's when you look in the mirror and start singing, How Great Thou Art. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, that's the proper way to do it. Um, think about ethics. Let me look at uh, page 11. Um, if you're God, you finally get to self-realization and Godhood. If you're God, does, does everything you do right? Yeah, well, there you go. So, uh, and fortunately, there are some people who s supposedly have gone through self-realization, yeah. Um, yeah, well, therefore, they do whatever they want, whenever they want. So this just turns people into sociopaths, right? Because uh, I'm God. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. And uh, because I'm God, it's never wrong. Okay? So there's the sociopath. Uh, now, of course, I already mentioned the problem of evil. If God is all and God is good, where does evil come from? You know, it's, uh, it's an illusion. It doesn't actually exist. And that's when you punch and kick and, you know, take their stuff, take their wallet, you know, and, hey, 
then you get arrested, so don't do that. It's only, a, you know, it's only a, you know, uh, you just suggest, what if I hit you, kicked you, you know, cut your leg off, be real graphic about it, you know. Uh, find something that's really important to them and then, you know, gross them out with it and then say, well, evil exists, doesn't it? So, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, the point is don't really hit them and do this. Like, that's assault and battery. You get arrested, you know. You might have made your evangelism point, but you're more effective out of jail than in jail. So, uh, so I want to keep you, keep you doing that. So, all right, um, j- just a couple other things. Um, skip down to the doctrine of creation on the bottom of page 11. Okay. See, in pantheism, creation is ex Deo, not ex nihilo. It's out of God or from God, but not out of nothing. So, hence, the creation itself is divine, so God uses pre-existing stuff, and the only stuff that exists is the divine stuff. So, so, again, which means that whatever exists would have divine properties. So like I said, it's literally, you know, whether the expanding bubble or balloon or whatever it happens to be, see, that's really the, uh, the pantheistic notion of creation where uh, the, the biblical notion of creation is completely different. And the problem is, if you look at the world, here's, you know, argument against it. Um, if God is the world, God's self-destructing according to the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, so he's running down, entropy is affecting God. Uh, so... And of course, this is why we just have, uh, you know, it's why we're not pantheists, right? It's just incoherent uh, to affirm these things. Lots of other things I could say about this, but I don't have the time. Um, one of the big epistemological problems in pantheism is, say, they would reject what they would call, at least, and you'll talk with New Agers and people like that, we'll talk about. Um, um, well, you know, you start to make distinctions. They say, well, you're using Western linear thinking, okay? <laughs> you know, because the problem is if God is all and God is one, then distinctions, contradictions are only apparent. They're not real, okay? And, and that's why it can be really frustrating to talk with someone who's more knowledgeable in a system like this. And, of course, what, you know, so the idea that distinctions and this and that, they're just, they're just illusions, but... <laughs> The problem is, is you know, how do you draw out the fact that they recognize these distinctions? And the, the, the reality behind it is, um, we think about logic distinctions, identity, uh, all of that. There's a very important task in thinking. Uh, but as we think about, you know, Western, even, you know, Aristotelian thinking, lo- Aristotle's primary laws of thought, the law of identity, law of excluded middle, law of non-contradiction, okay? And the whole idea is why these are the three primary laws of thought is because their denial presupposes their use, okay? You have to use these. These are, you know, these are the primary laws of thinking about anything. And, you know, say A is A. No, it's not. Well, you're assuming that A is what it is to distinguish it from something else to say it's not. Um, So again, you know, each one, its denial presupposes its use. So... Uh, law of excluded middle, either A or non-A, or you know, law of non-contradiction, a thing can't be both A and non-A at the same time in the same sense. That can mean everything from, you know, proposition can be both true and false at the same time in the same sense. See, that's why when they say, we're using, you know, you say, you give your stuff to the, uh, uh, how do you flesh this stuff out in meaningful ways? That's when you tell them, you know, well, you're using Western linear thinking. Glad I'm, I'm glad you agree with me and you're a Christian. <laughs> what? No, I don't. Oh, yes, you do. I'm, I'm good. You agree with me. I, no, I just told you I didn't agree with you. No, well, according to you, I mean, you say that's Western linear thinking, so A can be non-A in the same time in the same sense. So you agree and disagree with me at the same time in the same sense. You know, there are no contradictions here. So, and that's really, you know, again... That, that's the way you're going to, again, you got to learn to personalize if you're saying, but, you know, the law of non-contradiction says, but, <laughs> you know, people are, you know. So what you do is give them the rhetoric first, then give them the principle, and that's where they'll, you can hook them uh, in the discussion. So, but that, again, those are the kinds of conversations you have with, you know, New Agers and more educated Hindus uh, and folks like that. So, um, all right.
contemporary examples of these groups. Look at page 12. Hinduism, other Eastern religions, Christian science, New Age movement, uh, three main ones here. And when you look at uh, what's Hinduism, again, uh, my, my undergrad degree was in comparative religion, ethics, aka religious studies at Cal State Long Beach here. And uh, you know, so we looked a lot at every possible form of Hinduism and things like that in the degree program. And the thing is, is there's, you know, there's major sectarian groups and denominations and everything, but there's uh, um, uh, virtually the same. They believe pantheism, reincarnation, and karma. I mean, that's really defining characteristics. Even though in many types of Hinduism, because there's so many manifestations of the pantheistic divine, it, it's at some point starts to look like polytheism but they're still affirming it as pantheism because these are just manifestations of the divine, of the one undivided divine. So sometimes it looks like polytheism, but it's really ultimately pantheism. Um, I already mentioned Christian science, but there are other, quote, mind science cults in the name of Christianity, uh, science of mind, unity school of Christianity, uh, things like that. So these are part of the cult of Christianity that would be pantheistic or mind science uh, types. Or, you know, the New Age movement, which is all about uh, really bringing Hinduism and Eastern thought to the West in acceptable forms. And so this was bigger back in the 70s when people were looking, you know, after our, you know, sort of hippie, hippie guru stuff in the 60s, now people are looking for alternative spirituality uh, now that the Eastern religions are here. And so now you have this sort of, people didn't like, a lot of people didn't like the formal um, types of Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, things like that. So instead, it's like the occult, which is actually the New Age movement, is Eastern religion usually plus one type of occult practice associated with it, whether it's uh, channeling or whatever you happen to be into. And, uh, but in this case, you find out with, uh, th this is more individualistic. And the new age, everybody gets to you know make uh, de define their own religion, create their own religion, uh, and all of that. So, so that's the um, that's the new age movement. And then what's always connected with it is reincarnation. And uh, not gonna, the idea of reincarnation is 100% incompatible with the Christian worldview. And why? Because um, uh, again. Our view is resurrection, not reincarnation, okay, period. Uh, so, you know, again, God pays for our sins. We're resurrected from the dead. We don't go from life to life to life to life trying to work off our bad karma. So that's the uh, big difference. And, and, of course, there's some group, you know, Shirley MacLaine and all these other <coughs> New Age say, well, reincarnation was taken out of the Bible in the 5th century. You know, you hear stuff like that, and you're just like, oh, man. No, you just wish you could just sort of grab people, do a Vulcan mind melt, you know, just sort of fix them right there. It's like, I don't even have to argue with you about this stuff. It's just way too silly. But, uh, but, but here's your, you know, now uh, probably had scripture authority canon criticism, now that you're textual criticism experts, uh, you know, on all that. Um, how do you refute the idea that Christianity was taken out of the Bible in the fifth century? What would you need to refute that? You could. Okay. 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 What do you want to add? Yeah, that's right. So all right, it's taken out in the fifth century. All right, but then we have acceptable copies, you know, again, Old Testament, you know, that's but just New Testament documents. Really, so we've got the uh, John Ryland fragment, early second century, the Bodmer papyri, the Chester Beatty papyri. Uh, we've got Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Vaticanus. We've got, you know, all these things. You know what? We haven't found reincarnation in those yet. 
you know, these acceptable, you know, uh, codices and, uh, and texts that we have. So, yeah, so the point is, is yeah, oh, you know, as I say, it's, it's an interesting theory ganged up on by a brutal bunch of facts, okay? So, <laughs> uh, that's the, uh, yeah, so you get the idea here. So, so that's uh, pantheism in a nutshell. And now you're gonna, I'm going to take a one-minute break, so you know, too much water here. So, uh, 